Okay, welcome again. Thank you for coming out to uh, our event today. I'm Arlen Rosh. I'm the Vice President of Novak Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. Uh, can I have a show of hands of the number of people here that are members? Okay, people that are not members? Well, thanks for coming You're out. Welcome. Uh, we're uh, uh, a little bit of advertising. We're uh, the world's largest amateur astronomy club or awesome resource for people interested in astronomy. So uh, please find out about us and, and uh, uh, come to our meetings. They're free. You don't have to be a member to come to our meetings. We hold them once a month at George Mason University in Fairfax. Uh, find out more about us. We have a lot of resources for amateur astronomy. We allow people to come to sites like this to uh, enjoy dark skies that you can't see from Washington, D.C. So we have a, just a lot of resources to, to help and to find out more about this hobby. Uh, so today, you're in for a real treat. Dr. Mike Reynolds will be giving a talk on preparing for the upcoming total solar eclipse. Dr. Mike Reynolds has over 40 years in astronomy and space sciences. He has received numerous recognition for his work, including 1986 Florida State Teacher of the Year, NASA Teacher in Space National Finalist. In my thinner day. Uh, including the 1986, uh, okay, and the 26th Astronomical League Leslie C. Peltier, did I pronounce that correct? Uh, award. Uh, Reynolds has written a number of astronomy books and articles, including as an astronomy uh, contributed uh, editor. He has led numerous astronomical expeditions worldwide and has also served as an invited speaker internationally from book signings to lectures on meteorites, eclipses, and general astronomy. He uh, was an invited TED speaker talking about the universe as our classroom. Dr. Reynolds has appeared on several Disney Channel and National Geographic programs. Dr. Reynolds' uh, total solar eclipse chasing starting with the 19 <laughs> 70 eclipse has taken him to 18 total solar eclipses with some 53 minutes spent in totality under the shadow. In honor of his popularization of astronomy, the International Astronomical Union honored Dr. Reynolds with the naming of asteroid 2004 SY26 Michael Reynolds, nominated by David Levy and Tippi Diora, uh, 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 David Levy of great fame. Um, uh, Tippy as well. Uh, Dr. Reynolds is currently a professor of astronomy at Florida State College. He is the eclipse coordinator for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, otherwise known as ALPO, and currently serves as the ALPO executive director. Please welcome Dr. Mike Reynolds. Thanks, Arlen. Thank you. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. As Arlen and I have talked about over the last couple of months, I I get a lot of invitations, especially with the upcoming eclipse, to talk, and so I'm kind of selective, but I remember how, what a great job all of you did with last year's Alcon and how well everyone was treated, number of friends I made here, so I really want to return and spend some time with you talking about the eclipse. Now, I'm gonna warn you in advance. What I really need to say takes about an hour to talk about observing the eclipse, about an hour and a half to talk about photographing the eclipse, and about another hour and a half to talk about how to calm down and cool down after totality. Obviously, we don't have that sort of time. So I'm going to give you kind of a quick nutshell type thing. I'm not going to talk a lot about photography. I just did a workshop at the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference on <laughs> eclipse imaging. I was surprised at the interest with the imagers on imaging the eclipse. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and take blame for this heat. I did fly in from Florida, <laughs> and um, <coughs> yesterday as I'm getting ready to leave to go to the airport, UPS pulls up, and they drop off my porch a new telescope and mount. So it's my fault that it's cloudy. So I'll be suffering up here in the heat, just like you, as I talk about eclipses, and um, get you a little excited come August 21st. So let me ask this question. Total solar eclipses, not lunar, but total solar eclipses. How many of you have seen a total solar eclipse? Put up your hands. Look around out here. The vast, vast majority of you have not. Do everything you can do, and you'll hear me say this several times, to get to the path of totality. It's something that you will never, ever forget. People say to me, Reynolds, you've been to 18 of them. Why do you keep going? Go to one. 
and you understand Dan really hit that very hard with talking about his Eclipse in Aruba and beyond that. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. T minus 112 days, 20 hours and six minutes, but who's counting? I don't know who's counting, but I certainly am. Um, there's these kind of technical definitions of eclipses, like the total partial obscuring of one celestial body by another, or the passing into the shadow of a celestial body. Those don't touch the experience of a total solar eclipse. Total lunar eclipses are beautiful in their own way. Total solar eclipses, though, I can't describe them. I'll show you pictures. I'm going to try to describe them. You, it's an experience. You've got to experience it. These definitions don't even touch it. Not even close. So before I really get into this, let me just let everybody know, up here on the front table, right by Dan's two nice maps, I have a card for everybody. This is the ASP, Astronomical Society of the Pacific's little information card with a hole punched in it that you can use for pinhole projection in the eclipse. And I have a handout that I prepared that has general information as well as, more importantly, websites that you can get in touch with to get information about the eclipse itself. So just some quick, quick astronomy because I am a professor. I do some teaching. There will be a test, so be prepared. Um, solar eclipses occur very simply where you have the moon fall between sun and earth with the moon's shadow um, being projected on the earth itself. Lunar eclipses, which more common type of eclipse because the entire night side of earth sees this, which occurs at full moon, the earth falls between sun and moon and earth's shadow then falls on the moon. Um, total lunar eclipses are beautiful, spectacular. I even like penumbral lunar eclipses because they, you get these wonderful shadings on the moon that are pretty spectacular in, in their own right. But most of us have probably seen a total lunar eclipse and they are quite beautiful. But people say, well, Reynolds, come on now. We're talking about, you know, full moon you see lunar eclipses, new moon you see solar eclipses. Why don't we see one every month, one of each? Well, it's because that Earth-Moon orbit is just slightly tipped to the Earth-Sun orbit. So most of the time, the moon or the Earth's shadow goes above or below, so we miss that treat. So one of the graphs I can prepare, again, this is me as a professorial, like to get this information across to people. As a comparison, let me just show you again the three types of eclipses. You're thinking, so three? Since when is there three? So this is what I've been told by students. The first, of course, is your solar eclipse. We have sun, moon, and earth. The second are lunar eclipses, where you have sun, earth, and moon. And the third type is called the apocalypse, <laughs> where you have moon, sun, and earth. So, um, it's amazing what I learn from my students sometimes, but the apocalypse could be an interesting one. So why do we chase eclipses? What's, why do people spend all the time they do chasing around the world and looking at these spectacles? Um, this particular eclipse is a wonderful one because it's our opportunity to have the eclipse come home. It's been a number of years since we saw a total solar eclipse pass over the United States. This is a nice NASA am animation which shows the path of both the penumbral and then the umbral shadow. You see now starting to pass on land. It goes on at um, Oregon first, in Idaho, near Casper, Wyoming, or over Casper, in Nebraska, right to St. Joseph, Missouri, across um, Columbia, right near um, St. Louis, Nashville, and then into the Carolinas and out to sea at Charleston. The shadow is moving about a thousand miles per hour when it first hits the coast and about 1400 um, miles per hour as it gets close to the center line itself. As you can see, all the United States is going to have, the continental United States is going to have a deep partial eclipse. Day and night different, no pun intended, it truly is. So you need to get, you need to get to the path of totality. You need to get to this about 67 mile wide path that runs from Oregon on through to the Carolinas. 
don't settle for you know 90 percent eclipse get to the path of totality by the way one of the terrific websites and, and dan mentioned this also he's got some graphics is michael's michael's site um greatamericaneclipse.com terrific maps really good information so i would suggest that you check out what michael has to offer there um if you want an unusual unusual eclipse party go to moonstock now we've all heard of woodstock but this is moonstock they have a, a music festival they're putting together and they're gonna have musicians to play up to four days on the day of totality at totality None other than Ozzy Osbourne is going to perform Bark at the Moon. <laughs> now, that's um, interesting, should I say. And no one can bark at the moon like Ozzy, so that could be interesting. So again, get to totality. This is kind of cool. This is just absolutely phenomenal. And there's really no excuses even, even, even if you end up doing this, make sure you have the ambulance pull to the path of totality first and then continue your ride on to wherever you need to go. <laughs> Don't miss it. So it is all about totality. It's getting to that center line and seeing this incredible spectacle. Um, some differences, good analogies. Bruce Bannon and the Hulk, partial and total, or maybe even another way to look at it, honey versus a honey badger. <laughs> Get to the path of totality or, or else you may have to be eating cobra. So where's the best place to observe the total solar eclipse? It's pretty straightforward, um, where it's clear. Ergo, look up or try to right now. And that's, Part of the challenge always with chasing eclipses is where is it clear? Where is it going to be clear? The good news is with the new GO-16 weather satellite, I think we have the best tool for prognostication along that eclipse line than we've ever had. Um, there's good forecasting tools out there, but we all know, you know, weather can be, well, weather. Is that a good way to put it? Um, again, this shows the time of totality um, the last six years as you can see mostly out west it's been pretty good a little bit of cloud usually over the Carolinas or over the Smokies but basically it's been pretty good but this is an unusual year as we all know think about you know your own snow levels up here and you know late season frost and 90 degrees in in April kind of crazy so let's take a quick look back and to in history about eclipses, just real kind of a fun look back, as I think it's kind of neat to think about some of these in historical terms. There were two Chinese uh, astronomers called Si and Ho, who were the court astronomers for the emperor. And the whole idea behind these astronomers was they were to demonstrate the emperor's divinity, the fact that he was divine, and so they were responsible for predicting things like eclipses. Well, it turns out that C and Ho got a little um, plastered. And when they got drunk, they failed to prognosticate an eclipse. And they, their job was terminated. I mean, literally <laughs> terminated. Talk about lack of job security. So uh, kind of uh, interesting scenario there. I often ask Fred Espinek if he ha ever had those sorts of problems with NASA. And he said, fortunately, we have computers a little bit better than that. There was a, a um, Father Benedict who saw a total solar eclipse and it so impacted him that he started this still famous Catholic work called the Benedictine Society. This is one of the churches in Europe that Jen Winter took a picture of showing totality like a ethereal beam just touching Benedict and forever changing his life and his ministry. This is a British expedition in 1870, and they observed in Spain. And after totality, um, the team is standing around in their coats, vests, ties, smoking cigars. A little bit unusual. This is a, the book that 
I co-authored with the late Richard Sweetser about eclipses. I want something, we want something different on a cover. You know, you can have great eclipse photo photos, but this was just, I thought, a classic about chasing eclipses. It's one of the very first eclipse photos ever taken. This was taken January 1st, 1889 on Cloverdale, California, and it's not a bad picture, is it? I mean, it's about a two-second exposure. You can clearly see the the sun's crown or corona, and of course the blackness, and here is the moon. And um, it turns out that this particular eclipse, that, which was attended by a number of um, professionals and amateurs, started the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So this was the particular event that got that going. So uh, U.S. eclipses from 1776 to 2017, basically during our United States of America, and you can see that this one is the first solar eclipse um, to visit only the United States. No Mexican, no Canadian, nothing else, no other countries involved with totality since 1776. That's why they call this the Great American Eclipse. So other eclipses, June 8, 1918, last time totality passed from the west to the east coast. I love this. Police enforce quiet so astronomers at university may make priceless observations. Movies to be taken, throngs seek vantage points. Now, I'll guarantee you, if anyone tells us to be quiet during totality, that ain't going to happen. But if you've been to a total solar eclipse, you know. You know how excited people get. And if you haven't, be prepared for that because, you know, I think that Dan talked about his wife and daughters and how they were hooping and hollering at totality for the um, 1998 eclipse. All right, here we go. Work, work. There we go. New York Times, 1925. Eclipse four seconds late here. Sounds like someone should have lost their head. But a brilliant show, seen from land, sea, and air. It thrills millions. City halts to gaze. Scientists now study the data. So, a lot of excitement around that eclipse. Uh, July 20th, 1963, um, a total solar eclipse just clipped part of the state of Maine. And as a kid, we lived in Florida, but I still remember the excitement around this particular eclipse, and it was on TV. March 7th, 1970. This is my first total solar eclipse. I was like mm, 16 and um, talked to my parents and let me use their car to drive from Jacksonville, Florida up to Waycross, Georgia. And I had read the books and had a couple people describe what I might see. Nothing prepared me for that event. And took a picture, turned out pretty decent, was in the middle of a cow pasture. And what kind of amazed me is as it's getting dark, the totality that shadows approaching the cows turn around and start going back, I guess, to the barn. Totality hits. They're heading back in, but it's night. Totality's over. They turn back around, come back out again. They were programmed to react to that light. And so they thought, no, oh, that was a short night. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> come on back out and start grazing again. Two other well-known eclipses. Um, this is 1979, February 26, that went in and then swooped up to Canada. I actually observed it north of Winnipeg in July 11th. A lot of Americans observed or tried to observe in Hawaii. I ended up observing this eclipse just south of Mexico City. Again, wonderful stories, wonderful stories you hear about this. We had a young Mexican man um, join us. And so it was a whole bunch of us from different parts of the country. I had my wife who's been with me to 10 total solar eclipses and our son and daughter with us. This young man wanted to join us. So sure, come on, absolutely. He got so excited when that shadow and totality happened, he started yelling, holy sheet, holy sheet. So this is the holy sheet eclipse. <laughs> but lots of great stories like that. So what do you look for during totality? Partial is just like an appetizer. That's the honey before the honey bear comes in. But what you're going to see, and again, I'm going to try to describe this and show you some pictures. you got to see it. Forget what I say. Forget what you read. Forget the pictures. 
the only way to truly understand is to get to the center line. And so what's happening is, you know, you can see the sun is slowly being eclipsed. Maybe a thin sliver left. You'll notice that, well, the amount of brightness is dimming. The skies aren't very, very bright. It's getting a little dark. You'll start seeing these sharpening shadows that Dan mentioned, that little card's great for. But as the sun reduces to a point, what happens, you get these really crisp little crescent suns that dance on the ground. You'll notice the temperature starts dropping. Huh, that's interesting. The winds seem to kind of change a bit. So, is that odd? I'm sensing this, but the sun's still there. Then about 10 minutes before totality, someone will say, Venus. So you'll look up, and there next to the sun, you'll see the planet Venus with about 10 minutes before totality, a few percent of the sun left. Then other planets may start popping out in stars. Then you know something is about to happen. You look kind of towards the west, northwest, depending on how the shadow is moving towards you. You look over and you see what looks like a thunderstorm on the horizon. Very black and very ominous looking. That thunderstorm gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you look at the horizon now, you start seeing sunset colors. Those reds and oranges. And all of a sudden that shadow, like a hand, swoops over you. Those colors are all the way around the horizon and you're into totality. Again, I stand here and describe it. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Yeah, I have a PhD in astronomy, but I get really excited about this. I mean, it's, it's, you think it's hot in here now. Wait till I get finished. It's going to get even hotter. <laughs> and sometimes you see these things called shadow bands. So as the sun is just slightly diminished, there's interference that happens in the atmosphere. You may see these black and white bands run across the ground. Kind of an interesting phenomena. And then totality. Glorious totality. Planets and stars are visible. You see this beautiful second contact at Bailey's beads and diamond ring. The sun's chromosphere, you may see for an instant, the corona, the sun's crown, structure and features, prominences, these great gas loops that are many times bigger than the earth. Apparent darkness, and then how people and animals react. That's kind of interesting, birds nest. They think it's nighttime. Time to go to bed. It's going to be a short night, but they still think it's time to go to bed. And humans, that's maybe the most curious one of all. So, safety is important. Here we have the three blind mice in the early days. One minute till the eclipse, and those they had their binoculars ready to go. So, one thing you've got to remember, and really we're going to have to do the job educating people, for the partial eclipse, you've got to use good sense and eye safety. And here's the thing that we've got to pass on to people. It's not, it's not the eclipse that causes the issue. It's the sun. It's the sun. And so people need to understand that they need to use these eclipse glasses during the partial phase. Then at totality, glasses come off, and you look at the sun in all its splendor. But we're going to have to do some education here because there is a lot of misconception that's the eclipse that causes the blinding. It's not. It's the sun, period. Um, partial eclipse, again, you don't have to necessarily use telescopes to get a great view. Dan talked about this. Um, this is at Page, Arizona for the annular eclipse, May 20th. And this straw hat produces nice little eclipses. Um, my grandson had a piece of paper he had put little holes in. And so he was projecting eclipses and see those eclipses there. Those are from his fingers holding the card the light passing through his fingers. Leaves do wonderful things too. So you don't have to have a big telescope or a telescope at all to, to view that. Um, one of my favorite things to use is this thing called a sun spotter. Um, cool little Keplerian type of telescope that projects a nice image. Everybody can see of the partial eclipse. And also, I always kind of look for some interesting things to include in my photograph when possible. So, what happens is you're using this filter and um, photographing the partial stage. You can see just a sliver left after totality as the, as the um, shadow of the moon moves away from you. It's kind of a sad moment, but that's usually when everybody is hooping and hollering and 
enjoying something like Corona. Get it? Corona? Okay. Um, I, I know that Dan mentioned this. You really don't want a narrow band like a hydrogen alpha during totality. But during the partial phase, you may see some really cool opportunities to do some hydrogen alpha imaging um, as you're getting through that appetizer to totality. This was taken by Ron Brecher, who's a well-known um, astronomical imager, good friend of mine. So here we have what we're going to see on the day of totality. We've got the eclipse right there, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, not bad, not bad, Betelgeuse, and Sirius. And there are some who are going to be looking for Regulus really pretty close to the sun. Question is going to be, will we be able to see? It's going to depend on conditions. You know, how dry is air? All those things you heard this afternoon. We've been talking about imaging and talking about um, just being able to observe. So just a, a, a thing to look for. But I'm going to tell you, Venus, 10 minutes before totality, pop right out. It'll be, it'll be an amazing show. So I want to explain this photo. I, I take a lot of photos. My wife is very smart. After our first eclipse, she said, Mike, I love you dearly, but I'm not coming near any camera again during an eclipse. You go and take all the pictures you want, but I'm coming over with my Canon IS binoculars, my filter I can pop off, and I'm going to observe the eclipse. I said, yes, dear. So what I do is I have a variety of cameras set up. This was the November 13, 2012 eclipse. We were on a cruise ship. Tough life. Someone's got to do it, right? So I want to get in with a 16 millimeter Canon zoom, um, sun, sky, ocean, and cruise ship. But the problem was the ship was m oriented in a way that I couldn't get all of them in. So I said, okay, I'll do modern art here. I'll tip my camera to the side. So I took a monopod and I used a bungee cord and bungee corded it to the rail of the ship and then tipped the camera so I could get sun, sky, ocean, and cruise ship. Well, I don't want to be messing with this during totality. So what I did, as I set it on auto exposure, every few seconds to take a photo, and this photo was going to be, you know, something like an 800th of a second. But I didn't want to change it. I didn't want to go on a auto exposure. So I set it up to be the same. So watch what happens. You're going to see about 10% um, of my photos here. I've put it into a movie, but this is way cooler than a movie. So here we go. Let me get, just let it run. I'll make a couple comments, but just enjoy. So you can see I'm adjusting it over. You can see how much darker the sky is getting. We're still at par partial eclipse here. Look at the sky down here, the colors, totality. See it? Look how dark the sky has become. Got the colors to the horizon. Notice how the sky is getting darker because you're getting more and more immersed in the shadow. I mean, it's nearly pitch black here. And now, diamond ring, the eclipse is over, and everybody's drinking their Corona. Again, I can show you these pictures. you got to experience it. Forget the pictures. Forget my verbiage and all these, all these definitions and discussions. you got to see it. you just got to see it. My wife does like photographing people. And she's taken some really nice, in fact, Dan mentioned this also, nice pictures of people. This was um, the old Gilbert Islands. It's now called Kiribati. And this is for the July 2009 eclipse. Again, the colors of the horizon, people on boats. That's just a cool picture. But she likes to photograph the people. This was my counter that I really like hers better. I had a, again, camera set up on the ship, automatic. And what I got here is this is the, like the top deck of the ship, two people observing, and totality. But I really like hers better because of the colors. Plus she's my wife, so I have to say those things. Diamond ring and second contact. Ladies, this is a diamond ring. I mean, this is just beyond words and, and spe spectacular. What you're seeing here, the last vestiges of the sun as the moon completely covers it, Right at maybe that lunar limb profile has maybe a little bit of a, a valley. Just really pre pretty spectacular. You can see a little bit of chromosphere here. 
You can see a prominence there and a very little bit of the inner corona. So totality. And I do put in some exposures here just so you can get a feel. Um, we do a lot of work with what's known as HDR, high dynamic range. We've been doing this like Fred and several others of us have been doing this for years until people kind of really said, oh, that's what you're doing. This is one eight thousandth of a second. Um, eight hundredth of a second. Notice again how you got beautiful, see the, the prominence is up there. Now you're starting to get that inner corona. Notice the real, real fine lines coming off the corona. Um, I took these two photographs about two minutes apart, um, two, in, two and a half minutes apart, as I want to show just how the corona actually changes as the moon is moving across the face of the sun. Again, some longer exposures, 500th, 250th, 125th, and 80th was about as high as I could go as I was on a ship. And the ship, uh, and your camera's bouncing up and down. And being a good science geek, I had made observations of how long that rise and fall was so I would know when to take my pictures. That's crazy, I know, but my wife just rolls her eyes and she's right. So we've talked about these stacked images. This particular image shows four images taken by four of us that were st that was stacked after this eclipse. This is April 5th, 2005. And um, again, see the beautiful um, chromosphere here. Wonderful, wonderful outer corona, inner corona, and Venus. Just a cool picture. But again, you gotta see it. I can't. I can show you all these beautiful pictures. You gotta see it. And that's why I need like about five hours really to talk to you about eclipses. Yes. Is there a chance to get a shot of Venus and I'm sure you probably could. I, you'd have to take a look at the elongation of Venus at the particular time. But yeah, you gotta think about where Venus is located in comparison to the sun, which we normally don't see. Of course, you can kind of track Venus also during the day, and you know, some of us have observed occultations of Venus by the moon, which, so yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea. All right, let's hit this button, there you go. This is probably my biggest artsy type of photo. So last time I used film, we were in South, um, in South Africa, actually, um, Zambia, Chisamba. And I used something called ectochrome. And I took a variety of exposures. And before stacking was stacking, went in and started stacking these. And it's very artsy-like. It's like, looks like the iris of an eye or a flower or whatever. So even though I failed art in college, seriously, I'm taking organic chemistry, and thermodynamics, and modern physics, making A's, and failing art. <laughs> seriously, I can't draw stick planets but I'm pretty good at photographing, I guess. So that was my art contribution. This is one of my favorites. In fact, this will be in the article I wrote for Astronomy Magazine. It'll be in the August issue, which comes out July 1st. It's a feature issue on photographing the eclipse. So this is the lead for that story. And um, again, this one we were in the, um, right off of Greece. And I took five of my photos and stacked them. That's really what the eye sees. It's a high dynamic range again. You know, again, you need like an hour to show you how to set up equipment, an hour how to photograph, and that sort of thing. But it just gives you a little, a little taste of what you can do. This was just sure dumb luck. So we're on Easter Island for this eclipse. You know, what a cool place to be. You know, you got these great statues and lots of astronomers, professionals and amateurs. And right before third contact, a very thin layer of clouds came over. I thought, well, this would be kind of cool. We'll get these neat effects as we watch the diamond ring. So I get back to our hotel. I'm looking at my pictures, and I looked at this, and I said, what the heck? There are lines running through my pictures. I had noise reduction under control here. I had a white balance. Why do I have all these lines? There's something wrong with my camera. And I start looking at the picture. It was shadow bands. Two of us, for the first time ever, just by dumb luck, captured shadow bands at that eclipse in the sky. Never saw them, just happened to photograph them. It's 800th of a second exposure. I just pushed a button at the right time, took the right picture at the right instant, and got shadow bands. So, beautiful diamond ring, but those thin lines are shadow bands in the sky. 
boy, I tell you, sometimes, sometimes you just get lucky. And that's maybe part of it, just getting lucky. So some other clips photos challenge you to take these. Moon pie photos where we have the sun, partial eclipse, and totality. <laughs> the beauty about this eclipse, it can't get cloudy, and you can eat it afterwards if you want to. <laughs> See, I am an artist after all, aren't I? Yeah, right. My wife rolls her eyes there. She, got, again, loves taking pictures of people. Um, this is Kiribati. Um, again, what used to be called the Gilbert Islands. And um, wonderful people. Just wonderful. And it's the first place I've been in the world, and I've been all over the world, there was no McDonald's. No McDonald's! It was fantastic. Um, so my wife takes pictures of folks on the boat. This is the um, 2012 annular. It's our grandsons, Kieran and Quinn, observing the eclipse with me and my wife. And this, this August, we have six grandkids, and all six of them are coming along with us to observe the eclipse. I just want to have that experience with my grandkids. And so to me, that's, you know, here I'm a PhD astronomer saying, I want to have this experience with my grandkids. I've had it with my kids. They, I told them they can come along if they want to, <laughs> but you know, nonetheless, grandkids too, so be spectacular. And sometimes people have a little fun with me, which is okay. This is Jerry Armstrong's drawing of me on Easter Island. The statue saying, you dumb, dumb, give me gum, gum. And of course, my response is after the eclipse. So with all due respect to um, Night at the Museum. So plan your eclipse experience. Dan mentioned that. Don't wait till last minute. Get your eclipse glasses, your eclipse viewers, your filters. There's even some kind of fun kids type of thing. Make sure that when you buy your solar glasses, they're CE and ISO certified. Very important. They've been tested and made certain that you know, they eliminate the harmful radiation and light that you need. So get those. You can pro you're probably going to be able to get these Eclipse Day if you want to pay five bucks or ten bucks a pair. If you buy them now, you usually get them for a couple bucks each. Or if you have like Novak goes together and buys a whole bunch, you can get them for like 50 cents each, 66 cents each. They're not very expensive. Get them now. Um, filters. Again, Dan did a great job talking about filters. I won't belabor the point there. Um, I kind of like using the Botter Mylar because it gives me more true color and the images are a little, a little sharper. That's, my pers that's just my personal preference. I've used them all. Uh, safe solar viewing is always a must. No matter who's looking at the clips, make sure your dog or cat is well prepared. Now, there's a story here. I've got to write a book one of these days. Story here. There, um, a good friend of mine was the director of a planetarium, and for the 1994 annular, he had a phone call after the eclipse from a woman. And she said, sir, I need to talk to you about the eclipse. Y yes, ma'am, well, how can I help you? Well, I want to know if I can let my dog go back outside. And he said, um, ma'am, I, I don't quite understand. Well, I don't want him to look at the eclipse and go blind. <laughs> so make sure your dog has the solar um, glasses on if he or she's going to look at the eclipse. I think they have more sense than humans. Again, I mentioned the Botter. There's a new product that was just put out by Daystar I love. And what um, Jen Winter has developed is a Mylar filter that's like you take it with you flat so you can, if you're flying somewhere, you don't have to worry about damaging it. And you fold it up and put it over the end of your optics. Great idea. Absolutely fantastic. Um, make sure you've got your sight booked if you're going somewhere. Don't wait to test your binoculars, telescope, or camera. I used a full moon. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But make sure you've got all your stuff ready to go. Um, don't wait till August to purchase this stuff, because it's going to be very difficult to get to you in time. If you don't do any advanced planning, you don't get your, your solar glasses, filters, get your equipment ready to go. You may think it's a zombie apocalypse trying to get this stuff, but it is going to be hard to get when you get into August. Um, no hotel, you're going to venture out to, to the eclipse, you're going to find this. No vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy, except for maybe the Bates Motel. Now, there are frightening scenarios out there already. Um, a hotel in Oregon, I think it was Salem, but not, I know it was Oregon, um, people have made reservations, you know, a year before the eclipse. Um, in February, the hotel called, all the people had reservations, said, 
We're canceling your $200 a night reservations, and you may rebook at $1,000 a night if you want. Three night minimum. Scott Roberts, who number you know with Explore Scientific, a maker of that particular telescope, um, he's going to go to Casper. So he thought, well, maybe I'll just rent a house. You, know, you can rent a house for a week, and the prices are pretty reasonable. Some of the school like to the winter star party. That's what we do. So Scotty calls. He gets a real estate agent, and the agent says, yeah, I've got a house. And so Scott says, well, that's great. Um, how much is it? And the agent says, $5,000. So Scott's saying, $5,000 a week, that's a little high, but we'll have a whole house. $5,000 a day! You can buy the house! I mean, that's insane, but you're seeing that some sort of gouging. So make sure you get that done. Um, get your site early. Plan to make any weather-related relocations in advance, or you're going to run into this. One of our NASA AAS eclipse meetings we had some conversations with Department of Transportation um, planners. They're very concerned about almost a hurricane-like evacuations um, on what type of traffic on Eclipse Day. So just be prepared. This is another one of Michael Zeiler's maps. And what he's showing here are the major north-south interstates that lead into the Eclipse Path. Of course, up here, you guys are talking about shooting south. On I-95, I-95 hooks into I-26 in South Carolina. You can either run east to um, the coast or west towards Columbia. Um, Asheville, Greenville, South Carolina is a great site. And no one knows about it there yet, except for the people who know about it. In other words, hotels are available. And I think you get like two minutes and ten minutes of total, two minutes and ten seconds of totality there. So, never quit looking. I've been to 18 total solar eclipses, knock on wood, I've seen 18, which is, I think, almost a miracle. I've come close to getting skunked out three times. I'll tell you about one. Um, this was 2002 in South Africa. We set up early, poor liner scopes as my son Jeremy, myself, Jen Winter, and Vic Winter, we were going to photograph. About an hour before totality, in rumbles, solid overcast like this. So I'm thinking, well, you know what? Looks like I'm going to miss this one. But I saw the beauty of Africa and going on that photo safari and such as that. And you can tell totality's coming. Gets dark. Yet Jeremy, Jen, Vic, and I are still looking through our polar-aligned telescopes. About 45 seconds before third contact and in the to totality, we can see the sun. We can see the corona. We can see the eclipse. So we're just taking pictures, Jeremy shooting a video. Later that night, we're having a dinner with a lot of people. And they're all kind of mopey, you know, we didn't see the eclipse. And Jeremy's saying, what do you mean you didn't see the eclipse? You were standing five feet behind me. What are you talking about? Well, it was cloudy. I never saw anything. So Jeremy takes out the video camera and shows the guy who is five feet behind us the eclipse. Don't quit looking, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. So just keep on, keep on, keep it on. The other thing, even someone like me who loves to photograph eclipses, I don't get stuck behind the camera or even the telescope for the entire eclipse. I mean, this warning, you've only seen one warning like this flashing on and off. Take time to look around. You know, notice the, the changes in the, in the colors and the shadow and the planets that are visible and so on. You don't get stuck completely behind the camera. And there are ways to make sure if, you're going, if you want to take pictures that the camera doesn't monopolize your time. The main thing is, again, just not getting into photography a lot because it's a whole session on its own, is like making sure the thing's focused, that you have a charged battery in your camera, that you have medium that has space left on it. Ooh, whoever thought about that? And back to F word again, focus, focus, focus. So after that eclipse, where's the next one? Well, some of us have already made our plans to go to um, Chile. We're gonna fly into Santiago and drive north and observe a sunset eclipse on July 2nd, 2019. So that's our, our next and then reflect, share, rejoice, celebrate. And again, um, Corona or Mount Gay 
Eclipse Barbados rum. So there's a variety of ways you can sim simply celebrate with your friends and family. Um, one of the most spectacular events we can view in the cosmos. One thing you hear me read is this. It's a woman by the name of Mabel Loomis Todd who wrote a book and um, it was called Corona, uh, Corona and Coronet, being a narrative of the Amherst Eclipse Expedition to Japan. So listen to this. This is the best description I ever read about totality. Then an instantaneous darkness leapt upon the world, an earthly night enveloped all. With an indescribable outflashing at the same instant, the corona burst forth mysterious radiance. But dimly seen through thin cloud, it was nevertheless beautiful beyond description, a celestial flame from some unimaginable heaven. Simultaneously, the whole northwestern sky, nearly to the zenith, was flooded with lurid and startling brilliant orange, across with which drifted clouds slightly darker, like flecks of liquid flame, or huge ejecta from some vast volcanic, volcanic Hades. The west and southwest gleamed in shining lemon yellow, Least like a sunset, it was too somber and terrible. The pale, broken circle of coronal light still glowed on with thrilling peacefulness, while nature held her breath for another stage of this majestic spectacle. Truly the best written description I've ever seen. And so I wish all of you the clearest of skies in the shadow. Get to totality and keep looking up. Thank you again. So, I, we have time for some qu questions, Arlen? Yes. All right, so questions. Yes, please. Um, from the time that you, uh, you know, uh, reach totality, you say that, you know, that you uh, don't have any problem looking at the uh, clips because there's no time at that point. How long do you have before you have to start worrying again? The sun is very good and it gives you its own little signal. There's a little bit of debate on this. The official word is you should take your filters off right after diamond ring and put them back on right as, a, as the third contact diamond ring starts. There are some of us who push that just a little bit. Um, just a little bit. I usually will take my filters off my cameras at about the time the diamond ring forms and then put them back on right after diamond ring. So you saw that one photograph of the shadow bands. Um, those are good bookends though, diamond ring to diamond ring. <coughs> yes, sir. Not with those glasses. Gotta have those glasses off at totality. In fact, my recommendation with those glasses just probably have them off maybe 30 seconds before totality. And actually some amateurs and professionals will wear an eye patch over one eye to dark adapt it. I tried that once and it gave me such an unbalanced feeling that it was like, man, did I have something like moonshine or something before I observed this eclipse? So, you know, I, I think it's up to you. Okay, other questions? Okay, right there, and we'll go to the back. Do you take, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh-huh. Oh, absolutely, because otherwise you're not going to see anything. That white, that, that sun filter must